It's such a pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. I'm Douglas Anderson, Dean of the Huntsman School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome our honored guests and this audience of students, faculty, and community friends of Utah State University to a conversation between Randall Quarles, who will later give this year's George S. Eccles Distinguished Lecture in Economics, and Dr. Ben Blau, George Eccles Endowed Professor of Finance and Department Head of Economics and Finance here at Utah State. Welcome, gentlemen. <laughs> Before we turn to Ben and Randy, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to share some history of George Eccles and the lecture that now is given in his honor here at Utah State University. George S. Eccles was a leading figure in the nation's banking industry for more than half a century. As CEO of First Security Corporation, he played a key role in founding and guiding the enterprise, which held the dis distinction as the nation's oldest and largest multi-state operating bank holding company at the time of its historic merger with Wells Fargo and Company in 2000. A son of pioneering Utah industrialist David Eccles, after whom this beautiful conference center in which we are met is named, George grew up here in Logan, Utah. After attending Utah State University and the University of California at Berkeley, he went east to Columbia to finish his undergraduate degree at Columbia Business School in New York City in 1922. There he met fellow student Dolores Lolly Dore, whom he wed in 1925. While George began his banking career in New York, the young couple returned to his home state where he and brother Mariner founded First Security Corporation in 1928. George served as its CEO for almost 40 years from 1945 to 1982 uh, with his death. George and Lolly went on to become two of Utah's most active, generous, and honored civic leaders and philanthropists. Today, their legacy of generosity continues through the George S. and Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation, which has awarded more than $700 million in grants since its founding in 1958, and its mission to better the quality of life for all Utahns, including generous support of this university. The George S. Eccles Memorial Lecture in Economics is an annual lecture which began in 1974. The John M. Huntsman School of Business, with the support of the Eccles Foundation, and the Center for Growth and Opportunity invites a top expert in the fields of finance, bank, banking, and economics each year to present relevant information from their areas of study and experience to members of the Northern Utah community and thus to foster George's ideal of spreading economic literacy. In the years since 1974, there have been many notable individuals who have brought to this campus wonderful insights and distinction as the Eccles lecturer, including top government and business leaders and numerous Nobel laureates. It is fitting that in the Eccles 50th year, less one, our guest today is Randall Quarles, now executive chairman of the Sinusure Group. Randy is best known to the public as the distinguished former vice chair of the Federal Reserve System and as a senior official at both the International Monetary Fund and this country's Department of Treasury. It is fitting for another reason as well. Mr. Quarles is a relative by marriage to George Eccles and his famous brother, Mariner Eccles, the seventh chairman of the Federal Reserve System, after whom the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the Fed is named. This city, Logan, its university, our business school, this state, this nation, owe a great debt to the two great Eccles brothers, Mariner and George, and to the extended family of their father, David Eccles, whose legacy lives on not only in this beautiful conference center in which we are now met, but in so many other ways as well. I think George, who I had the privilege of knowing when I was an undergraduate, would be especially proud and pleased that Randy has consented to join us today and that his wife, Hope Eccles, is with us as well. Won't you welcome Randy and Ben up to the stadium, to the stand. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, Dean Anderson, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, Dean Anderson ha has asked me to moderate this discussion, and at the risk of overselling here, I don't know if there's a time in history, maybe a couple of times in the history of the United States, where it could be as compelling to have uh, someone uh, that served as the vice chair of the Federal Reserve here. I, th I think of the Great Depression, the financial crisis, perhaps the inflation that we experienced in the, in the uh, late 70s. Uh, but here we are uh, experiencing inflation that we haven't seen in 40 years. So we're, we're super excited to have you here, Randy. Uh, I wanted to start off first by just asking you to provide maybe the faculty, staff, and students some of your background, both uh, public sector and private sector. Uh, uh, sure, well, uh, I started out as a child. Uh, <laughs> uh, here, uh, I grew up here in Utah, went uh, east to go to school, uh, and started my career as a lawyer uh, at a, a firm in New York City that was one of the uh, that's one of the main financial services law firms uh, in the country, and as a consequence, that became my uh, area of expertise. Uh, and when, uh, in the aftermath of the savings and loan crisis of the late uh, 80s and early 90s, which is actually, we'll probably talk about today, I think that's relevant in ways that people haven't been focusing on to some of the pressures that we've seen it with Silicon Valley Bank and others. Um, the uh, the Treasury put together a team of uh, people with different backgrounds. They had an academic, they had a, a uh, investment banker, a young uh, investment banker named Jay Powell. Uh, they had somebody from the Hill and they asked me to come down as a lawyer uh, from New York to join that team uh, working at the Treasury in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And it turns out that once you've uh, participated in something like that, your name gets on a list. Um, so I went back after that to my law firm, was a partner with my law firm in New York, uh, again working mostly on these financial services, financial structure issues, bank uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, the George W. Bush administration came, I was asked to rejoin the Treasury uh, because my name was on a list, uh, uh, served there doing both the international work as the Assistant Secretary for International Affairs, international uh, financial diplomacy, the, the uh, uh, default of Argentina, for example, the pressures in uh, Latin America uh, in sovereign finance. Um, uh, then I became the Undersecretary of the Treasury, uh, working on domestic financial issues, the structure of the financial system. Uh, and then uh, left the Treasury to join the Carlyle Group, where I was a private equity investor for many years uh, as a partner there. And then it turns out that once your name is on a list, it never comes off the list. Uh, and when the Fed was uh, uh, looking to appoint the vice chairman, who would be particularly responsible for uh, financial stability and the structure of the financial system, uh, they asked me to do that, and I joined the Fed in 2017. Very good. Very good, thank you for that uh, background. Uh, remind me, the, the savings and loan crisis, this was the Brady Commission? So, yes, headed was, by Reagan's administration. Exactly, so the, um, uh, the team was put together uh, while Nick Brady was Secretary of the Treasury and George H.W. Bush was the president. So the, the savings and loan crisis really came to a head during the Reagan administration uh, and then in the aftermath of the savings loan crisis, there was a lessons learned, how should we approach changing the structure of the financial system, and, and the team that did that in the Brady Treasury, late 80s, early 90s, was, I was part of that. Very good. Uh, let me ask you this question. How has your experience between the private sector and the public sector, how has that, that interacted? In other words, what have you taken maybe from the public sector and used in the private sector and vice versa? So. You know, we have, as most of you know, in the United States, it's a relatively unusual uh, practice uh, that people will serve in the public sector and in the private sector, and that many of, sen of the senior officials in the public sector have a lot of private sector experience related to their particular responsibilities in government. And in most, uh, most countries of the world, that doesn't happen. People follow a public sector career, uh, they follow that for basically their whole career. They retire from the public sector, and then they're generally uh, 
in the financial area, at least, they are given a senior uh, vice chairmanship role, sort of an advisory role on the board of a bank or something as the capstone to a career. But they do not sort of take anything that they have learned in the public sector with them, into, uh, in the private sector with them into the public sector. There's not that uh, sort of uh, interplay that there traditionally has been in the United States. And you know, there are pros and cons to that, but I think it's a strength of our system uh, because it does mean that the officials in the Treasury who are charged with, you know, considering the evolution of the rules around the financial system uh, usually have experience uh, kind of at a granular practical level and not just at a, a theoretical or policy level with the implications of the, uh, of the government policies that they might be pursuing. Um, and I think that uh, leads to uh, leads to better outcomes. So it was certainly the, I mean, the reason I was asked to come into the Treasury was that, you know, I did have a very granular understanding of the laws relating to banks and the financial sector and how they worked together. Uh, and, you know, as a private equity investor, a lot of my investing was, it, it was entirely in the financial sector, put together a, a fund at the Carlyle Group to invest in financial services, and a lot of that was in, in banking. And so there I gained more of an appreciation. We invested largely in smaller institutions, smaller banks, of the role of the smaller banks in our system, uh, and, and, and was able to bring, uh, again, sort of a very uh, particular experience with that to my responsibilities at the Fed. Very good. And the Federal Reserve, uh, let's see, you, you left the Fed in 2021, is that right? 2021, yes, 2020. December 24th of 2021. I said that it was my Christmas present to Elizabeth Warren. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, that's great. That's great, let, so let, thank you for that background. I think that, uh, that speaks volumes. Let's, let's get down to it. We're here uh, in 2023, we've experienced over the last year, maybe some of the highest inflation that we've experienced in 40 years. Uh, can you comment on uh, maybe how you think the Fed has responded uh, uh, to the, to the inflation, maybe sure. maybe just give us a background on 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 this uh, environment. So, uh, you know, the, obviously there's been a fair bit of criticism of the Fed for how it has uh, responded to this inflationary episode. I think when you you know when we review the history of it, uh, it's I, I think the Fed actually gets a reasonably uh, good mark uh, for how it has been responding. So, uh, for really over a decade, inflation had been uh, quite low uh, in the United States and quite low uh, globally, certainly in the advanced financial economies, and materially below the target that the Fed had set for inflation. They had interpreted, the Fed, since the uh, chairmanship of Ben Bernanke, had interpreted its responsibility to keep prices stable as targeting a 2% inflation rate that lower inflation uh, than that would ultimately uh, create problems for the Federal Reserve in achieving its objectives over time, uh, so that stable prices could be interpreted as a, a 2% inflation rate, and inflation had been running well below 2% for a long time. Um, it, it, that didn't particularly trouble me uh, as a, a member of the Fed board or a member of the Federal Open Market Committee, but it, it was below the Fed's target, and it troubled a number of people uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the Open Market Committee. Um, in the spring of 2021, we began to see inflation moving up uh, materially for the first time in many, many years. And so it was, you know, you had, it had been running at about 1.5%, 1.7%. It was 3% in March of that year. It was 4% uh, in May of that year. At the beginning of June, it was, if I recall correctly, printing at an annual rate of about 5%. Uh, so the question was, well, what was happening? This is a very uh, abrupt move over a short period of time. Uh, and, and the most prominent thesis was that this was the inevitable result of different industries and different geographies emerging from their COVID restrictions at different times. So you would have demand picking up as people were, you know, as consumers were emerging from, from various COVID restrictions. Uh, 
but because of the interlinkage of supply chains around the world, the supply to meet that demand would not be able to move at the same rate because it would be limited by the, uh, by the least common denominator in the supply chain. Whichever jurisdiction in that supply chain had not yet emerged from COVID, uh, you wouldn't be able to get that part, supply would be less, inflation would be the result, but that this would be something that was in the Fed's famous and now regretted phrase, mm -hmm. transitory, uh, because, the, uh, because those supply uh, problems would work themselves out over time as the world finished emerging from COVID. Uh, and there was a good reason at the beginning of June in 2021 to look at that 5% inflation rate and say, you know, that narrative explains this because when you dug down into what was driving inflation at that time, it was one thing, used cars. Hmm. Um, because of the shortage of computer chips, that was still, because uh, the computer chips are produced in Asia, Asia was still under significant COVID restrictions. Uh, new cars these days are basically rolling computers. And so the supply of new cars was significantly constrained. There were almost no new cars available. If you wanted to buy a car in June of 2021, you had to buy a used car. And as a consequence, the price of used cars had risen over the course of two months by 25%. Mm. And it turns out that the way the math works in our inflation formulas, if the price of used cars goes up by 25% in two months, the aggregate inflation for the economy will be calculated to be 5% for the year, but nothing else was really increasing in price. Uh, and that happens a lot in our inflation calculations. And it's an interesting, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting topic, I think, for further study, how much aggregate inflation can be influenced by significant moves in individual goods that don't really affect uh, sort of most people or, or the economy as a whole. Uh, so the Fed looked at that and said, this is exactly what one would expect if inflation is being driven by supply chain disruptions. There's nothing to do here. I mean, theoretically, the Fed has the power. Its tools are very forceful. You could constrain aggregate demand in the economy so that the demand for used cars matched the supply of used cars in June of 2021, but you would have cratered everything else in the economy to do that. That would be a, a silly thing to do. So uh, the Fed held its fire. By September of that year, so at the end of the summer, it was, I think, clear to most people on the committee, not to everybody, but to most people on the Federal Open Market Committee, that uh, this was not actually a supply chain disruption driven inflation. We were now seeing inflation, inflation was a printing at a higher rate. We were seeing it across almost all the goods in the basket uh, that we measured to determine inflation. And the particular data point that I liked to look at was throughput through our ports. Mm -hmm. So the, if you, if, I mean, if you, if you remember back to that summer, there was a big story about all the, the ships that were lined up at the ports and you couldn't get the goods off of the ports and that was attributed to COVID. It was, you can't get the longshoremen back on the docks, they can't get the containers off of the ships and put them on the trucks in order to get the goods into the country. And as a consequence, you've got fewer imported goods, few, less supply to the renewed demand, that's gonna drive inflation and that will resolve itself as the longshoremen come back to work. That was the theory over the summer. By the fall, however, it was clear that actually throughput through our ports had exceeded pre-COVID levels. And by the end of that year, 2021, throughput through the US ports had broken records. It was the uh, most amount of goods that had been put through the ports in history. And yet you still had this big log jam of ships waiting to unload because there was so much demand for goods. It wasn't that there was too little supply, it was that there was so much demand. And that had been driven by the fiscal stimulus that we had miscalculated how effective I say we, but the Fed didn't have anything to do with the fiscal stimulus. That's all the Congress and the Treasury. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, but th we had miscalculated the, the effectiveness of that fiscal stimulus. It had been much more uh, effective in, in uh, sustaining and increasing demand than had been expected in the COVID response. And as a consequence, you now had a significant amount of demand in the economy that was greater than the pre-COVID uh, ability of the economy to supply, and you were gonna have to constrain that demand. Now, the good news is that that's exactly what the Fed can do. Mm 
The Fed can't make computer chips. It can't, ma it can't make new cars. It can't distribute vaccines. It can't put log shoremen on the docks. But it can constrain demand by raising interest rates. Uh, and that, it was clear now, was the, was the task. So the final thing I'd say if, in answer to your question, it's like, well, so how has the Fed been doing? I've said that was reasonably clear to majority of the FOMC by the fall of 2021, and the Fed didn't start raising interest rates until March of 2022. What happened? Um, I, that is attributable to an obscure element of the Fed religion uh, that, uh, that I think with hindsight the Fed will move away from. But there's a general principle that monetary policy, the Fed's actions should be coordinated. And if one tool that the Fed has is sort of providing accommodation to the economy, uh, it should not be trying to take that accommodation away with the other tool, it should use them in tandem. And since the onset of the COVID event in March of 2020, the Fed had been purchasing about $120 billion of treasury and mortgage-backed securities a month uh, out of the market. It, it did that for market functioning purposes as opposed to um, monetary policy purposes, but that has a monetary policy effect. Uh, and the Fed felt that it needed to stop those purchases before it began raising interest rates, or otherwise it would be pushing on the gas and the brake pedal at the same time. And it had learned in 2013 the so-called taper tantrum that some of you may be familiar with. Ben Bernanke announced in 2013 the Fed had been engaged in a similar practice of purchasing securities in the market. It announced, Ben just said, we're going to stop. Uh, and you know, the sun, the moon, and all the planets fell in on the markets with people uh, saying, well, you, you, you can't just stop. We've grown used to that. So uh, the Fed believed it had to taper those purchases over a long period of time, slow it down from 120 to 90 to 80, uh, until finally it stopped the purchases and it could begin raising interest rates. With the benefit of hindsight, I think that was a mistake. And you could have begun raising interest rates in the fall, even as you continued to taper those purchases uh, uh, for uh, market functioning reasons uh, over a period of time. And you would have been slightly uh, out of sync for a few months, but you would have gotten to the same point and you would have begun with your most powerful tool faster. Uh, all that said, that's the difference between September and March. It's six months, 30 years from now, when one looks back on the Fed's response to this inflation, six months will be a footnote and probably not in all of the textbooks. Uh, so I think the Fed, uh, it seems now as if it was behind the curve, but I don't think it's materially behind the curve uh, I think that its tools will be effective, and I think we're beginning to see the uh, inflationary response to its tools today. Okay, very good. Th this is interesting. So let me recap your suggestion. COVID brought about supply disruptions, uh, and with those supply disruptions, prices of certain assets started to rise, and uh, this is why the Fed is considering inflation transitory at the time. Right. Uh, let, let me ask you this. So we've had, uh, there's a debate among macroeconomists about where inflation uh, arises. Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winner who gave the Eccles lecture, I think back in the late 70s or early 80s, once said that inflation is and is everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Can you speak more to maybe uh, on the monetary issue, uh, maybe what, what brought about long-lasting inflation? So, uh, if, so that's... Uh, so that's interesting. I, um, uh, so I'm the chairman of something called the Center for Financial Stability, which was a, a, a New York uh, think tank that we started many years ago uh, to sort of look at some of these issues. And one of the things that the center has been doing for a long time is producing uh, analyses of the monetary aggregates uh, for the United States and for the other advanced financial economies uh, because central banking practice certainly and to even to a reasonable extent theory has moved away from the view that inflation is always a monetary phenomenon uh, and 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 so part of the purpose of of these uh divisia aggregates that the center puts out is to is to at least shine a light on the behavior of the monetary aggregates and they have been more uh, aligned with the actual behavior of inflation than, uh, as I say, current central banking practice would, uh, would allow. Uh, 
when I arrived at the Fed, I sat down with the monetary policy staff and just said, I want to talk through with you uh, sort of this idea. I mean, we're, you know, I, I've been part of this group that's been producing this monetary aggregate data that the Fed has not really been focused on for a long time. Uh, can you walk me through the theory of why that's not what you're currently looking at? He didn't have a particularly good answer. It was just, yeah, we don't do that anymore. Um, you know, we we look more at the uh, we look more at measurements of inflationary expectations as opposed to you know, it, looking at monetary policy and central banking uh, uh, actions uh, almost as much as mass psychology and and analysis of herd behavior. Uh, as opposed to uh, sort of actual financial developments in the economy. Um, and, you know, we, we may be seeing, I think, in the, uh, in the response of the economy to the very significant fiscal stimulus of, the, of, you know, from March of 2020 to March of 2021, uh, a return to thinking, well, maybe we need to go back to looking at just exactly how much money is in the economy as opposed to just what is the, what, what are the herd behavior effects. Interesting. Uh, okay, so flash forward a little bit here. We, uh, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates uh, to, to combat this inflation. Uh, if you go back a little bit, uh, in March 15th, 2020, uh, the Federal Reserve lowered the reserve requirement. This is how much uh, reserves a bank needs to keep uh, in, in case of these bank runs. You can see where the discussion is going to go. We're going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank here. The, the Federal Reserve lowers the reserve requirement from historically, it's been about 10% uh, down to zero. Uh, and, it, and, and reserves actually begin to increase, I think, just because of the COVID shock. Mm -hmm. uh, but reserves held at local banks have been pretty volatile probably over the last two years. Can you, can you uh, maybe explain that monetary policy tool, which isn't used very frequently by the Fed, this is the reserve requirement uh, change that happened in, in, uh, during COVID. So, um, yeah, the, the, so the Fed used to use the reserve requirement, I mean, even in my lifetime, that was a, a, a frequent tool. They, were, they would be fine-tuning the amount of reserves that, uh, that a bank had to keep at the Fed. And essentially what that means, the Fed is the bank's bank. Uh, and to say that you have to keep a certain level of reserves uh, with the Fed, means that, uh, that the Fed is saying to the banking system, you can't lend out as much money as you otherwise would have with your deposits because you have to take a certain portion of those and put them here at the Fed. And when we think that we need to constrain the growth of the economy, we'll raise that requirement. And when we think we can relax it, we'll lower that requirement. It used to be a quite commonly used tool. It had fallen significantly into disuse. And there was a change in policy in the aftermath of the great financial crisis that caused the Fed to believe, I, I, I think, I mean, it's, it, it, the, the development with the smaller banks is interesting, I think with good reason, that it no longer needed to use the reserve requirement at all. It had not really been changing the reserve requirement ever and uh, for a couple of decades. And uh, after the great financial crisis, it, the Fed was authorized to begin to pay interest on those reserves. Uh, and the Fed has since believed that it can largely control uh, monetary policy by the level of interest that it pays on those reserves. Um, and before elimination of the minimum reserve requirement, it paid the interest only on the reserves over the minimum requirement. The minimum requirement is you have to put those in there. Those, we don't pay you anything for those. We're, we will now pay you interest, however, on the amount of reserves you keep over that minimum level. And we control that amount by raising the interest rate. If we raise the interest rate, the banks will say, oh, that's not a bad rate. I'll put the money with the Fed. Um, totally riskless. Mm -hmm. um, we lower the rate, and they say, yeah, well, I, better, I, I, I will get a better return elsewhere. Uh, and in that view, you say, well, we don't really need the minimum reserve requirement anymore because we're controlling the whole reserve uh, requirement with the interest rate, and that also allows us to calibrate the interest rate across the whole amount of reserves that are being kept at the Fed. So just eliminated the minimum reserve requirement. The whole structure of, of 
the operational structure of monetary policy had changed significantly enough that it wasn't felt that the, that minimum reserve requirement was necessary anymore and it could all be handled through the administration of the interest on reserve rate. Okay. How frequently does that interest rate on the reserve rate change? Is the Fed adjusting that weekly, monthly? It, it's basically, that's basically the decision uh, that's being taken at the Federal Open Market Committee meeting every six weeks. Every six weeks, okay. Very good. Okay, so uh, when I was in grad school back in the day, uh, I was interested in studying banks and I had an advisor come up to me and said, oh, banks are boring. This is in 2005, 2006. I've learned <laughs> that banks are boring until they're not. And when they're not boring, the sky is falling, right? And so, uh, uh, so we, we flash forward, we have a, a couple of, of banks that have failed now, or at least there's mm -hmm. been a run on the, these banks, mm -hmm. um, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. And I wanna get your thoughts about this, but let's, let, me, let me try to set the stage here. We have, uh, we have some of these uh, regional smaller banks, they have a lot of deposits. Uh, they don't know exactly what to do with those deposits if there's not a lot of loan demand. And so they started buying long-term treasuries and locking in these long-term treasuries at, you know, one and a half percent, two and a half, two, two, one and a half to two percent. Um, and so these banks are, are locking in in these long-term treasuries. These are the assets of the bank. And then uh, through, I guess, economic conditions, and maybe I'll, I'll get your thoughts about this, they come and they try, uh, you have kind of a run on the banks where people are, are trying to pull out some of their deposits requiring some of these banks to, to sell these uh, uh, treasury bonds at, at a loss. Uh, this is Silicon Valley Bank. Maybe, maybe give us your thoughts on how the current economic environment, inflation, raising of the interest rates, causing bond prices, government bond prices to go down. Give us your thoughts on how uh, the Silicon Valley Bank run, the signature bank run, and maybe some of these other regional banks that are struggling. Uh, give us your thoughts on how this occurred and maybe what the feds, maybe critique the feds response to these bank runs, which again is part of the feds objective. Sure. Um, so, so what's happening with Silicon Valley Bank, what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and, and the pressure on some of the other uh, smaller banks as well, it is, uh, as I indicated, that it's really very similar uh, to what happened with the savings and loans uh, it, through the 70s and the 80s in the United States. So, uh, uh, you know, savings and loans were, any of you who, who have seen It's a Wonderful Life, uh, they were institutions that were focused really on one thing, uh, which was financing housing, making mortgage loans. Uh, and you would put your deposits in the bank, and then they would make mortgage loans with them. Now, that subjects the bank to significant risk because mortgage loans are very long-term, and very illiquid, um, uh, relative, certainly relative to treasury securities. Uh, you obviously make a lot more money on a loan than you're paying for your deposits, so it's a profitable business. Uh, but, and there were certain regulatory advantages that were given to savings and loans to encourage housing finance, to encourage people to, uh, to put their money into savings and loans so that, uh, uh, so that mortgage, a, a greater amount of mortgages could be made. But when the inf great inflation of the late 60s and through the 70s happened, uh, interest rates throughout the economy began to rise. Now the Fed was not particularly strong in responding to inflation at first during this period, but interest rates are going to rise anyway during an inflationary episode because people who are lending out money are saying, I, know, I, know, I not only need to get a fair return for my money, I need to get enough back so that I can cover the inflation over the life of this loan. So interest rates rise in an inflationary period quite apart from anything that the Fed does. Uh, and so the savings and loans were faced with the fact that they had made very long-term mortgages uh, at a fixed rate, which was the common practice uh, then, and their deposit rates were increasing. They had to pay more and more uh, to, uh, to keep their depositors, because a depositor can always just come and pull his money out, out, out of a deposit account at any time. So they were having to pay more and more, uh, and that business model got completely upside down. When the Fed finally did begin responding to constrained inflation and raised interest rates 
uh, uh, to 14, 15 percent, and mortgage rates were at, uh, at new mortgage rates were at 17 percent, and some of these savings and loans had mortgages out there at two and three percent. Uh, you know, the the industry was doomed. That's very similar uh, to what we saw with respect to uh, banks that had the business model of, of Silicon Valley Bank. They had received these deposits. They put them in longer term uh, assets. Now, these assets were more liquid and not as long term as uh, residential mortgages. But nonetheless, they responded in the same way to an increase in interest rates. The interest rate goes up. The value of those assets goes down. If I, want to, if I have a treasury security that's paying 3%, and the current rate for that treasury security is 4%, and I go out and want to sell it in the market, I'll find a buyer immediately. But the buyer will say, you know, I could buy a new one that will pay me 4%. So for me to buy yours, I just have to pay less for it than you paid for it, so that that 3% interest rate is attractive to me. So the value of the security falls, and the value of the assets in Silicon Valley Bank and a number of banks with uh, sort of similar business models uh, fell. That's not a problem provided that you don't have every, all your depositors coming in want, wanting their money out, uh, uh, because you will get repaid the, you know, the face value of that security from the treasury. There's no credit risk here, unlike uh, in the savings and loan uh, situation where there was also credit risk in these assets. So it's not quite, I mean, it's very easy in hindsight to look back at the management of Silicon Valley Bank and say, what morons? Uh, you know, the, the, this risk should have been self-evident to anyone. But it was, you know, we hadn't had an inflation er, uh, inflationary episode in decades. The decision that they were taking was, we're going to have totally liquid assets. You know, our depositors are going to put their money with us, and if they want their money, we have assets that we can immediately sell and respond to that. Right. Uh, they're... they're totally liquid, they are totally uh, riskless. And the only issue we would have is if interest rates suddenly started going up in a way that they haven't for 30 years, uh, and the value fell, and at the same time, all of our depositors wanted their money at once. That's not that big of a risk. Yeah, low probability. It, low probability. It turns out to have happened. <laughs> um, but. But one of the key aspects of this structure that also gave them a great deal of confidence, and I think gave the examiners of the bank uh, from the Fed and from the California Department of, of uh, uh, Financial Services confidence, was that it was funded by its depositors. And over history, banks that are funded by their depositors, even uninsured depositors, even very large and sophisticated depositors, generally don't suffer debilitating runs. Uh, and that's because it's a big pain in the neck to change your bank if you're a business, right? Uh, you, you, who would have thought you read something on Twitter and say, ah, I'm going to I'm going to decide that I've got to change my whole treasury operation, and I've got to find a new bank. I've got to uh, go through the process of opening a new account. I've got to uh, change my loans. I've got to get to know new people. Businesses traditionally have not done that, so. As you looked at the structure of Silicon Valley Bank, even as the interest rate uh, risk began to become more salient and the, and the market value of their assets was falling, people looked at it and said, thank heavens this bank is funded by its depositors. Mm. Because if it was funded by short-term wholesale funding or broker deposits or deposits from other financial institutions, uh, that money would be flying. But it's funded by its core business depositors and those people won't go anywhere. And that turned, out to be, that turned out to be wrong. And I think one of the big lessons that we have to work through here is why was it wrong? And we don't really know yet why these depositors behave differently than depositors have over the course of the history of the banking system. Yeah, it seems like uh, the tech industry is struggling. They're, they're leading the way in terms of layoffs uh, most recently. And so maybe, maybe that's part of it. it uh, uh, they had not diversified their deposit base across multiple industries, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I, so I think the two, the two main possibilities are that. They, they, their deposit base was very concentrated. And historically, both bankers and bank examiners 
have, they've been very concerned about whether your asset base is very concentrated, whether the money that you receive from deposits, whether you're putting it into one industry or one geography, and, you know, and that industry or geography undergoes problems, uh, and your bank is going to be difficult. So you think of small banks that were banking the en energy industry in Texas and the waves of sort of boom and bust that they have gone through. Or, again, back in the 80s, uh, uh, banks that were limited in geography, you know, the Utah in the 80s was undergoing a, a significant uh, economic stress, and banks that only had uh, loans here in Utah were under pressure. Uh, so, uh, so traditionally, again, bankers and their examiners have said, we need to find a way to diversify assets. Nobody's really worried that much about diversifying your deposits. Um, except unless you, were, uh, unless you were getting them from people who weren't your customers by paying more and advertising for it, and then in the internet world that became easier. And so you were drawing a lot of so-called hot money, money that was likely to leave uh, uh, upon the, the first signal that it ought to. Um, and it's possible that one of the things that these insured deposit, one, the reason these uninsured de depositors behave differently than in the past was because they were so concentrated and concentrated in industry that is particularly subject to fads and enthusiasms and herd behavior. Um, now, that's kind of gratifying to say. It's very easy and, and satisfying to make fun of the venture capital folks and the tech startups, et cetera. Uh, but it might be a little facile and the other serious possibility for why did these, and more concerning possibility for why did these deposits behave differently is, well, because this was the first bank run of the 21st century, really, where the first bank run since the invention of the smartphone, the first bank run since the time when Peter Thiel could say, my founder's fund is withdrawing all of its uh, uh, deposits from Silicon Valley Bank, and everyone sees that immediately on their cell phone. The first bank run since the time when uh, if you have seen that on your cell phone during the day and you're having a little trouble getting to sleep at night, you can get up at 10.30 and walk over to your computer and move your account. Mm. Um, and if the reason that the uninsured depositors in Silicon Valley Bank behave differently now is not because they were uh, sort of cultish faddists uh, you know, in a particular geography, in a particular industry, but because that's the way the world works now, then we have to rethink a lot about how we regulate banks, and particularly smaller banks, that tend to have high levels of uninsured deposits and concentrated business customers. Interesting. Uh, let, let's go back to the bank side. What role, so, so here Silicon Valley Bank and some of these other banks have bought long-term treasury, treasury bonds. They face interest rate risk, especially as the Fed begins to raise interest rates. Uh, what role does the Fed take in allowing or promoting these local banks to hedge this interest rate risk? Is this something that bank examiners go into banks and ensure that there, there are, are risk, there's risk management taken, uh, taking place with some of these banks? So, um, so yes, the question is, uh, the question turns again on how much risk do you think that there is? So all banks are required, banks of any size are required to stress their models, uh, assuming that interest rates are going to rise uh, by a certain amount. And if you've been in a, 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 a sort of extended period of low interest rates, you have to assume that those interest rates are going to rise by a significant amount. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the rules generally say it has to be by at least 4%. So every bank has to go in and assume that if interest rates rise by at least 4%, what do I think is going to happen to my bank? And do I have the ability to respond to that? But in looking at that, they say, uh, you know, one of the assumptions is, how quickly will your funding leave if, you ha if interest rates are rising elsewhere, right? Uh, and, the, and, and the framework, both the supervisory frameworks and the regulatory frameworks have assumed, as we've been talking about, that depositor, uninsured business depositors, your core depositors, are pretty sticky. Mm. So uh, th that goes to the hedging question of, do you need to hedge the interest rate risk in your portfolio? And the answer is, well, you might need to hedge the interest rate risk in your portfolio if you believe that your liquidity position was such that there's going to be a demand for you to sell those instruments 
to generate cash to satisfy depositors' withdrawal demands. If you think that the withdrawal demands in a particular situation are going to be limited, and again, all of the banking learning over the course of decades would have said that for Silicon Bank, they, Silicon Valley Bank, they would have been limited, then, uh, you know, then your need to hedge that portfolio is less. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons why um, uh, that's one of the reasons why the regulatory frameworks and the supervisory examination of Silicon Valley Bank was it was increasingly concerned, but it wasn't looking this at, uh, at this as a flaming dumpster fire uh, because it was saying, thank heavens, this bank is funded by its depositors. It has an issue, uh, but it, it does not have a existential issue. I see. Uh Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan, which, by the way, these bigger banks have benefited from some of these regional banks' trouble. You, you, you might have seen the report that uh, many of the Sil Silicon Valley bank depositors had headed into to Bank of America, which has systemic issues going forward, right? Yes. Uh, Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan, says uh, that this isn't over, right? Uh, and, is, and, is, and is sparking some concern in, uh, in some folks that particularly have their money tied up in regional banks. Uh, your thoughts about uh, what Jamie Dimon has said. H how's the stability of the banking system? Put us at ease here. Um, so I, I, I think, I mean, the stability of the, ba the, the banking system as a whole uh, is quite stable. Uh, it appears that the, uh, so it appears that the deposit outflow from the smaller banks to the larger banks has abated it hasn't yet reversed itself. Um, it's not clear that it will entirely reverse itself or when, uh, but it does seem that kind of that sweeping outflow from the smaller banks to the larger banks has, you know, that, that that's stabilized. Um, I, I haven't, uh, uh, so I haven't uh, talked to him about exactly what he was trying to say here is, but I think I, I agree with this concern, which is we could have both a regulatory response and an economic and structural and financial uh, evolution that could further consolidate banks in the United States. So again, when I started out as a child, there were 14,000 banks mm. in the United States. Today, there are about four, um, you know, over- Thousand. The four not thousand four banks. yes not four banks sorry <laughs> make, make sure right. they're awake <laughs> today they're about four thousand um but i did just come back from you know so there's been a significant amount of consolidation but we get a lot of benefit from a structure where we have uh, a handful of very large banks and then thousands of smaller banks that are willing to respond more um uh, you know again uh, on a more individualized level with their customers who uh, get to know their customers better, uh, who are uh, focused on a particular area or community. That's a, that's a good thing. That is a strength of our system in, in uh, funding the dynamism of our system. Um, and you know, we, we all know, I mean, it is simply a fact that when a smaller bank is acquired by a larger bank, there are services uh, that that bank no longer provides. There are customers that that bank no longer serves. Um, I just came back from uh, speaking at a U.S.-Canada summit with the former finance minister of Canada, uh, who raised the point, and we were having a conversation sort of like this, and he raised the point, doesn't Silicon Valley Bank show the superiority of the Canadian banking system? And as many of you may know or you may not know, there are about six banks in Canada. Uh, the whole country is served by six giant banks uh, uh, that are absolutely safe. And during the pressures that our banking system has gone under a few times over the course of the last 15 years, the great financial crisis, COVID, now SVB, the Canadian banks sail on solid, completely unconcerned. Uh, and he said, so doesn't this show that this is better? He's kind of a cheerleader for Canada. I like the man a lot, but he's a big cheerleader for Canada. Um, <laughs> and my answer was, there are pros and cons, right? It's unquestionably 
a benefit that you have that stability in your banking system. But the con is that you don't have that dynamism in your banking system uh, that we have in the United States. You don't have that dynamism in the economy of new businesses easily growing up uh, because they can find funding from various sources. So a concern that I have in saying that this isn't over is that, you know, A, there could be a regulatory response that increases the cost of being a bank, and just inevitably now, smaller banks will have to consolidate in order to bear that cost. Uh, you can also have a financial response where just people are less willing to interact with a smaller bank, and so banks are gonna have to consolidate to reach a size that people say, all right, I can deal with you. Uh, and either of those is going to have a cost for our system. It, it will create a stability benefit, uh, but there will be a, a cost in dynamism that, you know, over a long period of time, it can be a problem for the country. Uh, interesting. Well, well put uh, about the dynamism of, of these banks. Uh, the fractional reserve banking system. Uh, in a day and age where Twitter or Reddit, you can hop on Twitter and Reddit, and, and uh, tweet something that causes a bank run or may, may lead to a bank run, is a fra fractional reserve banking system, is it, uh, is it in question or are we good? No, I don't think the fractional reserve banking system, I, I, I don't think that's in question. It, there are too many benefits to it. And, and basically the fractional reserve banking system is what causes the, you know, the possibility of this instability. It means that when you deposit your money in the bank, it does not stay in the bank. The bank, uh, keeps, a certain, keeps a little bit of it and lends the rest of it out. And it may or may not be able to get that money back immediately. It relies on the, fa the fractional reserve banking system relies on the fact that everybody won't ask for their money at once. And if I come and ask for all my money out of the bank, it'll give me the little bit of my money it kept and the little bit of all of your money that it kept, confident that you will not come ask for your money the next day when it doesn't have that because it just gave it to me. Um, and the the benefit of that is that you can support a much bigger economy on the basis of a certain amount of savings, on a certain amount of deposits. Uh, and that has been you know, essential to the growth over a century and a half of the advanced financial economies of the world, and particularly of the United States. If we move to a system uh, that, you know, where that uh, fractional reserve had to be much larger, there are those over the years who have, who have posited even narrow banks, which is to say that you literally put in your money and the bank has to keep the money. Uh, and it can charge you a little fee for holding your money and that's, how it will and that's the only source of profit for the bank so that you can be absolutely confident that when you come for your money it will be there and there will never be a, a destabilizing bank run such as we've seen. But then the only amount of financing that can happen is from the amount of deposits as opposed to the multiplier effect that comes from a fractional reserve system, and we would significantly constrain the growth possibilities for the economy. So I, I don't think that, I, A, I don't think it would be a good idea, and I don't think it's a likely outcome. Very good, very good. Uh, I've got two more questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, I'll spring this one on you. We have China and, and Russia uh, buying oil in Chinese currency. Uh, instead of instead of the U.S. dollar, uh, the U.S. dollar has been what we would call the global currency for uh, since since World War II. Uh, mm -hmm. What effect is this going to have on inflation? I was reading that if all of a sudden the dollar is no longer the global currency, then the dollars that exist out in the world are going to flood back to the United States. That's going to increase the supply of money and ultimately lead uh, to more inflation. Uh, your your thoughts on? the importance of keeping the dollar as the global currency and the risks associated with that? Um, so the United States gains a significant benefit uh, from being the dominant uh, reserve currency uh, in the world, from being the world's most desired currency. Uh, it's been called our exorbitant privilege. Uh, it gives us, you know, both at the national level and even at the individual business levels, uh, significant advantages. Um, I don't think that that position is at serious risk over, certainly over my lifetime. Now there are some lifetimes out here that are gonna be a lot longer than my lifetime, uh, but I don't think it's really seriously at risk over your lifetimes either. Um, uh, you know, the dollar's position as the, the dominant uh, reserve currency has gradually been evolving over decades, ever since World War II. In the, 
monet in, a, in the international monetary system immediately after World War II, the dollar was the anchor. Mm. The dollar was tied to gold, and every other currency in the world was tied to the dollar, uh, and, it was, and, and they were worth a fixed amount of dollars. And that was the system, and that was the system that the International Monetary Fund was created to, uh, to maintain. And all of that changed in the 70s with the inflation that was uh, building up in the United States, and we moved to a world of free-floating currencies. And in that world of free-floating currencies, all it means to say that you're a reserve currency is that people in the world, especially central banks, want to own assets that are denominated in your currency because they will believe that they will maintain their value and be quite liquid. Um, the dollar is not the only currency that serves as a reserve currency in the world now. Central banks around the world have a portion of their assets in euros. They have a portion of their assets in pounds. They have most of their assets in dollars. And that relative percentage has been changing over time. The dollar has been a little less. Other currencies have been a little more. Uh, as the relative size of the US economy compared to the world economy shrinks. Uh, but there hasn't been any dramatic change in demand for the dollar because, uh, because what makes the dollar valuable is the confidence in the US economy, in the dynamism of our economy, uh, in our trade linkages throughout the world, in the credibility of our monetary policy, again, compared to the rest of the world, uh, in the depth and strength of our financial markets, the ability to, to uh, easily uh, trade these assets that you hold that are denominated in dollars. And none of that is changing. None of that's changing dramatically. China is not a significant competitor on any of those fronts. Their financial markets are, you know, are stone knives and bearskins. Their, uh, you know, their trade linkages are the, the, the uh, they, they are a big trading partner of the world, but their currency is difficult to convert. Nobody trusts the legal system in China. Um, it, the, again, the, the sources of value of the dollar are not significantly changing. I don't think they're likely to change in our lifetimes. I'll, I'll tell one quick story. I'll try not to make it too garrulous. Um, when I was the Undersecretary of the Treasury, one of the hats I wore was as the Chief Bond Salesman for the United States. And there had been, a, this was in 2005, this was happening. And uh, there had been a uh, political controversy in the US over the acquisition of a company that managed a number of ports on the East Coast by a company that was based in Dubai. Um, the disappointed domestic bidder went to Congress, said, why have we let these foreigners, and particularly these foreigners from a world where there are, from an area of the world where there are terrorists, control our ports? Uh, huge opera in Congress. Now, in the government, we'd been perfectly happy to have Dubai uh, purchase uh, this, the company that ran the ports because Dubai was one of our chief allies in the war on terror. They really knew how to handle terrorist risks. We were very happy about that but it didn't play politically. And, and as a consequence, people in the Gulf began saying, well, if they don't want our money, maybe they don't want our money. We buy a lot of treasury securities, uh, and maybe they don't want us to buy treasury securities anymore, and we're gonna start uh, buying things other than the dollar. It was exactly this sort of thing. We don't need the dollar anymore. So it was okay, put on my bond salesman hat, I flew out to the Gulf, met with the central bank governor of Abu Dhabi, um, who had turned this into a big press event. He meets me on the steps of the central banks where he gives a statement about, we don't need the dollar anymore. Uh, I'm going, yeah, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and then we go into his office uh, and I say, now, we're really, we, we have really managed this. You know, the, the acquisition has gone through. I'm sorry for this political controversy. And he says, oh, I just have to say that for public consumption. Uh, he says, I have no <laughs> choice. I, have no, I, I can't do anything other than buy dollars. He said, what am I, I could buy euros, and then what am I going to do with them? Invest them in Italy? No. Uh, so the, the point is, is that the attractiveness of the dollar depends on all of these deep factors that are gradually evolving over time, but they are not going to be subject to a dramatic reversal, and therefore the, the position of the dollar as the dominant uh, global currency is, is evolving, but not likely subject to a dramatic reversal either. Okay, very good. We're almost at time. The question that everybody's been waiting for, all uh -oh. right? Uh, let me recap our discussion. Inflation is subsiding. 
Uh, the Federal Reserve has responded in a way that, that inflation is, is now, now coming down, uh, converging towards the target inflation rate. The banking system seems to be stable. Uh, the dollar uh, is not in, in, uh, at risk of becoming nothing less than the global currency. Uh, is there going to be a soft landing? Are, are, we, are we heading for a recession? Is this going to happen or is, is uh, what, what Jay Powell has said uh, and hopefully what the Treasury Secretary uh, means by a soft landing, is there going to be a recession uh, coming out of this inflationary environment? Yes. <laughs> But to expand a little more. Okay, very um, good. Uh, well, it would be very surprising if there weren't a recession because in every tightening cycle that the Fed has conducted since World War II, there has been, I mean, they've never achieved a soft landing in the past, so I have no idea why we would expect them to do it now. That is, that, that, now that's technically not right. They managed to uh, uh, sort of raise interest rates without triggering a recession once in 1947. Uh, but it was significantly less inflation and a significantly uh, smaller interest rate increase than we're undergoing now. So it would be quite surprising uh, uh, for there not to be a recession as a result of this tightening cycle. The question is, you know, how dramatic is it? There are recessions and there are recessions. My expectation is, is that precisely because this is the sort of inflation that the Fed's tools can, uh, can promptly and completely contain that you'll get back to a, a, a satisfactory level of inflation without all of us having changed our expectations about the, what the world will be like after that. This remains a very productive economy. It remains the most dynamic economy in the world. It remains the biggest opportunity in the world. It's a very healthy place, fundamentally, once we've managed to contain this inflation. Uh, and so we'll come out in a, in, in, in a very strong period. So that would suggest that this, that this recession that's coming, very likely, uh, is short and is shallow. Now, it probably is not as short and as shallow uh, as it might have been if you hadn't had some of these banking stresses currently. I think the Fed is probably overshot a little bit, not terribly, uh, the target interest rate that would have been necessary to... Uh, to constrain the inflation in these circumstances. Um, so maybe a little longer and a, and a little deeper uh, than it might have been, but nothing like the 1970s, nothing super dramatic, uh, nothing like the great financial crisis. You get to the other side of a, uh, of a technical recession and we've got uh, a very appealing economy in front of us. Very good. I thought we were going to uh, have to end on you just saying yes, and that was a, a source of pe pessimism for all of these, these uh, attendees here. So I appreciate your optimism. I certainly appreciate your willingness to come and, and have this discussion uh, with us, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll conclude there. Let, let's give uh, uh, Mr. Randy Eccles a hand. Thank you so much, Randy. I just want to make one comment before we leave the stage entirely, and that is to all the students that are here today, I hope this will be something that you can anchor uh, in your minds, particularly those of you who are studying money and banking and, and economics. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I've mentioned uh, both George and Mariner Eccles before, but Mariner Eccles was present uh, as I recall, uh, at Bretton Woods in 1946, when this, uh, uh, this great reserve currency was established, uh, as, as uh, Mr. Corll said about the, the dollar being tied to the gold standard and all other currencies tied to the dollar. And that wasn't changed until August 15th, 1971, when President Nixon closed that gold window uh, and we went into a world of floating currencies. It was in the fall of 1971 that I first arrived here at Utah State University, and had the privilege of attending the banking seminar uh, that was hosted by George Eccles here on this campus, actually in the, uh, uh, in the uh, auditorium of the George Eccles Business Building, uh, which was, had, had just been opened just one, one year earlier. Uh, and he invited 
John Ehrlichman, who was uh, uh, President Nixon's domestic policy advisor and probably the third most powerful man in America at that time, to come speak at that event. I remember that event very clearly. And I hope you, 50 years from now, you students who are here, will remember this event, which is, in my opinion, just as equally interesting as the one from 1971. So thank you so much, Randy. Appreciate it. Thank you.